We'll get started here in just a few moments. This is going to be an exciting evening. We have quite the guest with us this evening. Mr. John Kemp from uh, Northwest, or I'm sorry, Northeast Ohio. I hope it's warming up there. We'll get to John in just a couple minutes. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, this is going to be a blast, folks. Uh, we have a, an awesome uh, guest speaker with us this evening. It's going to be very entertaining, very deep. Uh, we're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, but the first thing I want to do here this evening is Rachel's got some updated information on where the Farm Green uh, recordings are and, and has to do with podcasts on the Apple platform. So, Rachel, go ahead and uh, let me stop talking and you let everybody know what's going on. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in tonight. As you know, when we do these webinars um, every Thursday, we do record them. So I've been editing these recordings and we have the full uh, video that you see here, the recordings on YouTube. You can just search Farm Green and find it that way. And then we also have the audio edited and we have those over on the podcast platforms. So we currently have them on iHeartRadio, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If for some reason you cannot watch on any of those three, please let me know and I will get it on another uh, form of podcast that will work for you. Um, please feel free to um, email me if you have any questions, put it in the chat um, if you can't find it. We also do have them linked on our website. So if you go to farmgreen.land, there's a tab up at the top that says podcast. You can listen to it directly there or it will take you to um, Spotify or Apple and you can listen to it there. So. Um, just please let me know if you have any questions, um, and we hope you enjoy. Rachel, thank you for making us look so good. Appreciate it. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Giddy up. Let's go. John Kemp, how are you this evening? It's an awesome evening. It warmed all the way up to 50 degrees today. Spring is on the way, so I'm pretty happy about that. That's that's great. That's great. Well, John, we're gonna we're gonna start this off the way we start all of our podcasts. I'm gonna ask you the only question you are aware of this evening, uh, pre pre uh, live time here. What is on your mind? What are you, what have you been thinking about? What what's right there? Well, what I've been thinking about is this afternoon I got to spend time. Um, on my hobby, which I really enjoy and love, which is beekeeping. So my dream when I was a teenager was to be a full-time beekeeper. I never expected to get into agronomy work. And um, there are two things that I really, really enjoy about beekeeping. So I'm getting back in this year. Um, I started with 50 colonies about three weeks ago. And um, so that's going to be my new hobby for this year. And there are two things that I really enjoy. I was, I was thinking about why is it that I enjoy beekeeping so much? And one of the reasons is that um, when I work with the honeybees, when I'm out there working with them, it kind of enforces this, this meditative state. Like you, you start interacting with a colony and it forces me to slow down and to really pay attention and to, and to calm down. If you get excited or if you're afraid or you get ticked off, whatever it is, there are immediate negative repercussions. <laughs> like they will make you pay for it immediately. <laughs> so um, there is there is this very meditative state and there's also this sense of deep connection and deep interaction with another living being, with another superorganism, really. It's a honeybee colony as a superorganism. And then uh, the second part that I really like is, you know, I'm, one of the things I also, that drew me into um, agriculture and agronomy is that it's this huge puzzle to figure out. It's like, it's a 5 billion piece puzzle. And every time we turn around, we discover another 50 new pieces that we now have to fit in somewhere. And beekeeping is much like that as well. It's also this very large puzzle. And if you want to be a really good beekeeper, then uh, you need to understand the landscape that your honeybees are in. You need to know the ecology and what's happening in the environment. So uh, right now, for the last two weeks, I could tell you exactly what is blooming and at what stage of bloom and whether it's providing pollen and nectar and 
So I know when the skunk cabbage starts blooming, I know when the pussy willows start blooming and the maples and the elms start blooming. And I'm paying attention to all that stuff. So beekeeping really connects you to the landscape and to the ecosystem in ways that uh, I don't know of anything else that quite does it. Well, that's, that's very interesting because that's what we're striving to do is to become one with mother nature. I, you know, I feel like I do a pretty decent job at that, but, but you've just, again, you, there's your $5 billion or 5 billion piece puzzle. You've just now got my brain working. Um, how do you, how do we become even deeper enthralled with, with mother nature and, and beekeeping, or maybe, maybe if you're not into bee, maybe we get to know somebody who is and maybe ask if we can help or join in. How about that? Yeah, I would say, you know, there are other things in general, working with, with, um, working with livestock, working with animals of some kind will tend to do this for people more easily than working with plants. Yeah. Plants are pretty passive. They can't strike back when, uh, when you misbehave. Um, but livestock can and bigger livestock, of course, particularly so. So, yeah. um, I think that's, you know, I, I get so fascinated with um, uh, the, the Bud Williams School of Livestock Management and, and their way of being able to move livestock just with body presence at a distance and guide them completely stress-free, completely calm, compared to the way that livestock is commonly handled. There's such a different ethos and such a different heart connection to uh, livestock that happens, and, and this, this can be true. I also have this type of connection with plants, and I know that some people do, but many farmers don't. And uh, it's because plants are relatively easy for people to ignore and not to pay close attention to. Yeah. Now, you you you, you did mention something there, though, that that is intriguing. You said that plants won't strike back. What do you think happens though if we get something out of balance? They're trying to tell us then, right? And maybe that's the plant's way of striking back. Well. Let me ask you this, if you or livestock, let's say cattle, if there was something wrong with them to the point where it was visually obvious, like they were in visually obvious bad condition, yep. let's say they, had, they were very thin and um, obviously had been suffering from not having enough feed for some time. You would call that cruelty to animals if it became severe enough. It becomes very obvious very quickly, and that would not be considered an acceptable situation at all. Right. So when it comes to animals or when it comes to people, visual indicators are not enough. It's If you have a visual indicator that something is wrong, it's way too late. You mm -hmm. should have been paying attention two months ago. And yet we consider that to be perfectly acceptable for plants. Once right. plants have visual deficiency symptoms, then it's time to start doing something about it. Even though the visual deficiency symptoms show up four weeks or six weeks after the problem actually occurred. Right. And um, so I think yeah, we have, we have different uh, mental expectations about what is appropriate for plant husbandry as compared to animal husbandry. And you know, there's a debate about whether plants are actually sentient. Um, there is no debate about whether plants have the capacity for intelligent decision making. Uh, there's this really fascinating book. I think I loaned it out, but uh, should be over here. Yeah, I don't see it right now. I moved off camera there for a bit. That's okay. Um, there's this really fascinating book titled Plant Intelligence um, by Stephen Herod Buner. And it's one of his trilogy. He has, he has three amazing books. One of them is, uh, I think the first one that he wrote is called The Lost Language of Plants. And the second one is um, The Secret Teachings of Plants. And the third one, the last book, is um, the uh, it's titled Plant Intelligence that I mentioned earlier. And each of these three, I recommend it very highly. They're a combination of scientific writing plus... Um, heart-oriented, poetic-type writing. They're an interesting blend of the two. But what he describes in the book Plant Intelligence is that plants have a neural network. Um, so when we think about our capacity for informed decision-making, we immediately go to them. We think of a brain. But 
uh, we, uh, we know that our brain is only a fraction, it's only a part of our neural network. Our total neural network also includes our gut and, and the neurons in our gut and our gut microbiome, which is very close in, in processing and computing power to our brain and also our heart. So when we talk about having a gut feeling, our gut has the capacity for informed decision making. It's a different form, but it, it is a part of our neural network. Well, guess what? Plants also have a neural network. They have, not only do they have a neural network, their neuron structure is exactly the same as ours. And they use exactly the same neurotransmitters, GABA and all these various neurotransmitters. They're exactly the same in plants as they are in people uh, or any other animal. And so uh, plants have de clearly demonstrated that they have the capacity capacity and capability for informed, intelligent choice making and decision making. And um, the, this neural network, these neurons that plants have are concentrated in the growing root tips. So if you have a plant that has this large root mass and this large root system, um, a really large root system like a, from a mature oak tree that's 80 years old, they will actually, a large oak tree has a larger neural network and more neurons and more computing power than we do. <laughs> See, John, you're, you're blowing our minds here. You don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. It's, well, it's, we tend to, I would say that um, we have tended to think of plants and animals, the boundaries between the two are blurring increasingly because in terms of their intelligence, any farmer, I mean, folks in academic institutions want to debate about whether plant or whether animals have the capacity for intelligence. Well, anyone who has experience with horses or with dogs or, or really smart livestock, it doesn't take you long to know that animals can be pretty smart. They have intelligence, they're capable of figuring stuff out. I actually have a really funny story around this. Um, I, I actually watched this happen. Um, I was visiting a farm in central Pennsylvania, or eastern Pennsylvania, uh, Amish farm that was farming with mules. And they had this pasture for the mules right beside the barn. And the mules were constantly testing the upper strand of barbed wire on the fence, leaning out over the fence and trying to graze on the other side. So this was obviously stressing and damaging the fence. The farmer was tired of this behavior. So he ran an electric wire um, all the way around the top, across the fence posts. And when I pulled in the driveway to visit for half an hour or so, he was just finishing hooking up um, his charger and his solar panel. And he had this small charger and he put it on top of the corner fence post, which was a sawed off section of a telephone pole. It was 14 inches in diameter. So he put this charger on top of the telephone pole corner post and asked his son to go let the mules out of the pasture. So we're, we're moved, we moved 50 feet away. We're standing there having a conversation. The mules come out and um, pretty soon one of the mules leans out over the fence and gets shocked and he jumps back and points his ears back and staring all around and just looks meaner than all get out. And he stares, he's looking around, looking around, and all of a sudden his ears flick forward to that corner post. He trots over the corner post, looks at that thing, <laughs> flicks around and nails it with his back feet, blows it into a hundred pieces. <laughs> no more electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> no more charger. <laughs> he figured out that that charger was what was different. And he destroyed it. It yeah. was... And it didn't take very long. No, it took him seconds. It took him seconds. And anyway, we understand that animals have intelligence. Any farmer understands that. We haven't thought, we don't, we generally tend to not think about plants having intelligence, but they absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Just because they can't move around um, and they're forced to grow where they're planted, we tend to ignore them. But you know, there's this, this comic that um, I've talked about it a bit. I need to, to share it online. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I know other people have as well, but there's two trees having a conversation 
uh, in this comic strip and the person is walking by and one tree says to the other, do you suppose that people can communicate? And the other tree says, no, how can they possibly? They don't have roots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, wouldn't that be something? I, 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 there's a lot of truth to that. So, so let's go a little, let's go off just a little bit here. You and I have talked a little bit about this, not very much in depth, but let's go a little deeper here tonight. What about trying to change then the, her, the hormonal structure or the hormonal uh, balance of plants? Talk about that. Yeah, this is something we work with quite a lot. Um, in it's very relevant for a lot of fruit and vegetable crops or for any crop it's very relevant for any crop that um, flowers over an extended period. So um, you can have less of an impact on say corn or wheat or small grains uh, with hormonal balance, although you can have some impact, but it's it might be a 5% or a 10% yield improvement. But when you have crops that blossom and flower over an extended period of time, like soybeans, for example, or green beans, then you can have a significant impact um, because the hormonal balance um, regulates that you can basically think of it as, and this is an oversimplification, but it's still an accurate way to think of it. You can think of it as a balance between reproductive energy versus vegetative energy. Uh, what, what's the balance between growth and fruit? And so you can have a soybean plant with the exact same genetics but just manage the nutrition differently so that the hormone profiles are different. And you can have one field with the soybean plants being um, 48 inches tall or 50 inches tall with nodes six inches apart and two pods per node. And you can have the next field right beside it be 24 inches tall with nodes inch and a half apart and six pods per node as the exact same variety. But it was just the nutrition was managed differently so you have a different hormonal profile. Um, so that's that's pretty interesting stuff to get into and um you want me to talk a little bit about how to manage nutrition to produce that yeah yeah i want you to know how do you what testing are you doing to see what hormones are present and then let's talk about what you would then prescribe to bring that plant to where it needs to be yeah um Testing for hormones, as I understand it, is primarily an academic exercise. We don't, look, we don't do that in our practice in the field in terms of a laboratory test, but what we do look at is what is the node spacing? We pay a lot of attention to node spacing. Um, the idea that you can have a bean plant that has nodes two inches apart instead of four inches apart, well, you've just doubled your yield potential on a 40 inch tall crop by having more tightly spaced nodes. And then, of course, there's also the influence of having more pods per node and so forth. Um, essentially, what it comes down to from a practical management perspective is that there are four nutrients which give a plant rapid vegetative growth. Um, those four nutrients are specifically nitrate nitrogen, not nitrogen in general, but specifically nitrate. Ammonium has the opposite effect. Ammonium will have a reproductive effect, but nitrate has a vegetative effect. Potassium drives vegetative growth, chloride drives vegetative growth, and calcium drives vegetative growth. But there's, a, there's an interesting little secret in this scenario. Um, so it's pretty common when we think about mainstream agronomy and fertilization practices, um, agronomists and Farmers today in contemporary agriculture are used to getting their plant growth energy, their vegetative energy from nitrate and potassium and chloride and not from calcium. And when you think about fertilization, you put on potash, 0060, marated potash has potassium chloride. Put that stuff on alfalfa all day long. You get alfalfa that grows really tall and has hollow stems and a wide node spacing and a poor leaf to stem ratio and has all kinds of quality issues. If you're growing grains, corn, small grains, you put on nitrogen fertilizer that converts to nitrate, you get the same type of effect. Well, you know, there's a lot more profit to be made selling potash and nitrogen than there is calcium. And the, the unknown secret that many people are not aware of is that you can get the same speed of growth and the same volume of growth using calcium to get your growth energy as you can from, getting nitrogen, uh, from using nitrogen and potassium. 
Okay. So this has been forgotten. Can I interrupt you just for a second here? So let, let, yeah, I just did. So (laughs) can I continue to interrupt? So uh, let's, let's look at if you've got enough calcium within your profile, but it's not available for that plant. So then what do you do? Sorry to interrupt, but I, I think this is important here. Yeah, this is really, really important, Rick. Like this, if folks would figure this out, um, fertilizer sales would be cut by 70% across the board overnight and across yeah. the entire country. It's a lot, lot cheaper to buy calcium than it is to buy nitrogen and potassium, has always been, it's always going to continue to be. Um, so if you have basically calcium delivery to the plant, there are many soils that have abundant calcium in the profile, but the plant doesn't, doesn't get enough, the crop doesn't get enough. And uh, there's foundationally two reasons for that. One is that, uh, one is a chemistry, uh, the simple fix is a chemistry challenge, is that most soils and most crops today don't have enough boron. Farmers in the regenerative ag space have been somewhat aware of this and have started addressing boron. But um, our rule of thumb is that, see, boron is an anion, it's negatively charged, just like nitrate nitrogen, leaches out pretty easily. Uh, same as nitrate, nitrogen, and sulfur do, until you have high enough organic matter and carbon to hold it. And so our rule of thumb is that um, in the early stages, as we're building soil and as we're building carbon, we need to add one pound of actual boron per acre per 10 inches of rainfall per year. So that means if you're in an environment with 30 inches of rainfall, you need three pounds of actual boron per acre per year, which is probably 10 times more than most people recommend. But it's that level of boron is going to give you tremendous calcium availability. It really triggers calcium availability. Uh, we have a, a group of growers that, we're, um, that we work with in central Pennsylvania where they have limestone-based soil, so they have a very high calcium base to begin with. That's not a problem for them. And uh, this one grower is, uh, is a dairy farm and he's growing lots of alfalfa hay um, and doing lots of custom work for alfalfa growers in the area. And on alfalfa specifically, which is a legume and has very high calcium requirements, uh, they're experimenting. They've been experimenting now for the last six or seven years to try to identify what, where is the upper threshold of boron for this crop in this environment really? Where is it really at? And... Um, they are now, as of 2021 growing season, they were applying five pounds of actual boron per acre in the spring broadcast with, and they started at a pound and then two and then three and then five, and they were doing this on test plots. And they're getting increasing yields and increasing quality all the way up to five pounds. And their experimental test plots last year were at 10 pounds per acre, and they still got increasing benefits at 10 pounds over five pounds. So they're approaching this fairly cautiously and year by year, just stepping it up um, and seeing what the cumulative effects are year after year. But at this point, they're doing five pounds per acre every spring across the board on hundreds on thousands of acres of alfalfa with increasing positive benefits. And um, this this is a story that I could repeat uh, probably 50 different scenarios from across the country where folks are experimenting with increased boron applications and getting tremendous crop responses. And again, Boron is cheap. You know, it's really interesting. Everyone has this fear of boron toxicity. It's mm-hmm. it's almost every conversation we have when we talk about putting on higher applications of boron. Oh, I'm afraid it's going to become toxic. And I've really wondered who sold that narrative and why. Yeah. Because here's the interesting part. When you get a crop that has high enough levels of boron, boron is kind of the magic mineral for insect resistance. You get boron levels high enough in alfalfa, you will not have leaf hopper. You will not have weevils. Um, and the same holds true of many other crops. Boron levels become high enough, insect problems just disappear. Right. Why is there this popular narrative that boron is a bad thing? It, you could almost imagine there's some type of a conspiracy behind it. Well, yeah, you could, we could come up with some answers, I think, pretty quick on that one, John. It, uh, this, this is exactly where I wanted this conversation to go. So, um, do you, okay. Let me ask you a question then, John. Let's go back to those those alfalfa growers. They're applying five pounds of boron um, in the spring, and they are taking multiple, I assume they're taking multiple cuttings off and total removal. So what are they bringing back to those acres? 
Anything else? Um, I believe it's generally the case that they are applying a broadcast combination of compost, uh, that's composted dairy manure and carbon, uh, and they're adding some gypsum and some calcium sources into that compost that's coming from the livestock who are consuming that, uh, consuming that hay. So right, there is right. some nutrient cycling going on there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's important to understand because that kind of removal is massive when there's a lot of, of nutrients leaving that, that field every cutting. So we yep. have to bring that back. I'm uh, not sure we do. I'm not sure we do, Rick. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very uh, controversial perspective and I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm persuaded, this is not true of all soils, by the way, but I'm persuaded that there are many of our Midwestern soils that have more phosphorus and potassium and calcium in them than we will remove in millennia um, if we just take crops off and take crops off as long as we farm them properly. Now, this is not true of all soils. It's not true of all contexts, um, but I think it's it's uh, there. The possibility for that exists. But I want to go back, Rick. There's there's um, two pieces. I want to not lose sight of the calcium as nitrogen comparison conversation. But I actually, you asked me a question about how do you increase calcium availability, and there's two parts to that answer. The one part is the chemistry part, which is boron as a calcium synergist, and the second part is that. Um, Calcium supply really is a function of biology because bacterial cells need calcium to form their cell membranes. Plants are then supposed to consume those bacterial cells through the rhizophagy process and absorb abundant amounts of calcium. And the reason so many soils have abundant levels of calcium in the soil profile, but the crop is calcium deficient is because we have a dysfunctional soil biology and we don't have enough bacteria to feed the plants all the calcium that they require. And so this is one of my frustrations with um, the emphasis that is often put, particularly by microbiologists, that is often put on the need to have optimal calcium to fungal ratios, in, or excuse me, bacterial to fungal biomass ratios in soils. Um, I'm not disagreeing with their premise at all. They are absolutely correct. But um, we can't look at ratios alone. We also have to look at total quantities. And if you have one bacteria and one fungi in a teaspoon of soil, I don't care that you have a one-to-one -one ratio. The quantity is so abysmally low to make the ratio irrelevant. And that's the situation we have on many agricultural soils is before we can have a legitimate conversation about ratios, we first need to elevate the levels of both bacteria and fungi to much higher levels. Right, right. And, and I'm assuming that the number one way to get there quickly is to start applying the principles of soil health, you know, minimize tillage, uh, chemistry, Absolutely. all of these things. So, but now let's go back. Let, let's, let's keep this calcium to nitrogen talk going here because this, this is important now because especially yeah. in the operation that we're trying to do here, I mean, we're trying to be organic with no tillage and trying to not add any <laughs> outside sources okay um this is very important um how many so pounds of nitrogen does it take to grow a bushel of corn yeah you're, how many pounds of nitrogen does it take to grow a bushel of corn you're asking me yeah i don't know i don't know well you can ask three different people that question and depending on who you ask you'll get three different answers there's the mainstream academic answer which for many years was a pound of nitrogen per bushel of grain or bushel of corn. And then it moved to one and a half pounds. And now in some areas, they're putting on as much as three pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn, which is absolute lunacy. But Holy that's, cow. that's a different conversation. I was going to say 0.65 is about where we are. Yeah, 0.65 is where you are. And I know of other organic farmers that are in the neighborhood of about 0.5 to 0.6. Um, and that's accounting for all the nitrogen, all the measurable nitrogen inputs coming from cover crops and compost and manures and so forth, which I'm sure you're accounting for that as well. So, and yet we know that on some soils, um, it's going, there is, it, you can accurately measure a one pound to one bushel. So what's the difference between soils that require a pound of nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn versus soils that require a half a pound of nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn. The difference is 
that the additional growth energy is coming from nutrients other than nitrogen, particularly calcium. And so you can think of the, the growth energy, the vegetative growth energy coming from calcium as a replacement for uh, some of the uh, vegetative energy from nitrogen. I'm not suggesting that we don't need nitrogen, obviously, but that the quantity required is significantly less when we are getting, when the plant is getting all the calcium that it needs. But we're missing one very, very important piece. We started this conversation by talking about plant hormones. Mm -hmm. And the important piece is this. Nitrogen, uh, the four nutrients that I spoke about, which give plants a vegetative growth energy, three of the four have a synergistic relationship with the plant hormone auxin, and they produce wide node spacing. So those three are nitrate, potassium, and chloride. So you know, if you feed soybeans with lots of those three nutrients, you'll get node spacing four inches or six inches apart. If you fertilize alfalfa with Marieta potash, you'll get a node spacing four to six inches apart. So you get this very wide node spacing. And calcium, has the opposite effect. So with calcium, you get a very close node spacing because calcium has a synergistic relationship with the plant hormone cytokinin. And for a lot of, for, for these crops like soybeans, this is a really, really big deal because the phrase that I used earlier was that you can get the same speed of growth and the same volume of growth with calcium as you can with nitrogen except there's one distinctive difference. Let's say if you, um, <clears throat> if you grew, if you had two soybean fields or you did a split treatment on a soybean field and you gave one block a treatment of 20 units of nitrate nitrogen and you gave the second treatment an application of 20 pounds of highly available bioavailable calcium both of those crops would grow from, if we put those on the V3 stage, or excuse me, the third trifoliate, uh, you could expect both of those crops are going to grow very rapidly to, well, let's say they're going to be at the sixth trifoliate in a matter of three weeks. You're going to get the same speed of growth and the same volume of growth. Uh, actually, no, I, I said that incorrectly. I should not have said V6, or excuse me, sixth trifoliate. What I should have said is both of those plants will grow to be uh, 36 inches tall in three weeks. But the plant with calcium will have double the number of nodes because the nodes are two inches apart. The plant with calcium will have nodes four, in, or excuse me, with nitrate will have nodes four inches apart. That's a really big deal from a yield perspective. Then of course you have to be able to fill that. Yeah, that, that's that's huge. Okay, so, so let's talk about now what, when would, okay, what's your calcium source? And is this something that we can, today is April the 14th, can we get calcium into a field yet this spring and yep. help? And if so, what is that source? You ask all the fun questions, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know if this was a, a build, you know, we have to build today for tomorrow type thing, you know, I didn't. It is a build today for tomorrow type thing in the context of it really is we need biology to deliver calcium. That is the true long-term solution. Um, as a partial answer to this question, uh, I would suggest we have, we have been taught to think about calcium as a soil amendment. And again, it's worth asking the question, why was that the framing? Why was that, why has that been the way that calcium has presented, has been presented? We should think about calcium as a fertilizer, exactly the same way that we think about nitrogen as a fertilizer or potassium as a fertilizer, but we don't, again, because it's cheap and there's no money to be made selling calcium. Um, and it also doesn't produce all the negative side effects that you can then sell pesticides for. But um, when we think about calcium as a fertilizer, the the key way to think about it is to match the calcium, the, the release curve of whatever product you're applying with the demand curve of the crop. And so I'm going to talk about this from a perspective of principles and I'll talk about some specific practices that we do. Um, 
let's say you're growing, so for almost any crop, the peak calcium demand is going to be a two week window that starts at pollination and then the two weeks after pollination. That is the peak calcium demand uh, curve. That's when we get the greatest crop response and the greatest yield response from calcium applications. So let's say if, if we're growing an apple crop versus a corn crop, the apple crop blooms right as it emerges from dormancy in early spring and the corn crop isn't blossoming and pollinating until late June or July. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So uh, late July, early August. So um, when we think about calcium as a fertilizer, um, we are often using either gypsum or limestone, the same types of materials that you would use as a soil amendment, but we're thinking about timing them differently. So the release curve for gypsum is such that um, about, depending on particle size and soil moisture and pH and all those variables, biological activity, you're going to start getting a release of calcium, uh, a significant upward curve about 30 days after application. And it's, that curve is going to then start, uh, it'll peak and then trend back down uh, to a point about 70 or 80 days after application, it starts dropping back off again. So that window between 30 days and 70 days, you have a 40 day window and you want that peak calcium supply window to match up with the crop's peak demand. Right. So if you're putting that, if you're putting gypsum on those apple trees, it needs to go on in February or March. If you're putting it on corn, you can't put it on until right at planting or maybe even a bit after planting. And this is one of the fundamental changes we've made with many, we've worked with many growers who've said, yeah, but I've, I've been using gypsum for years and I just, I didn't see much of anything. I didn't see much of a crop response. And the first question is, when did you put it on? And it's so common. It's a common recommendation to put gypsum applications on in the fall. Well, if you put a gypsum application on the fall on a corn crop, the corn crop's never going to see it. Well, I shouldn't say it's going to see it. There's going to be something there, but the, it, the, the de release curve doesn't match up with the demand curve and you get just a fraction of what that's actually capable of delivering. So uh, I think one of the fundamental challenges is we haven't figured out the timing for many of these applications. So in terms of practical management, practical application, if you are at this point, you are in spring, you are 30 or 60 days away from planting, um, the tools that you have to work with at this late stage, um, there, there's vari variation here based on soil pH. So if you have acidic soil pHs below 6.2, you should consider using limestone calcium carbonate. If you are um, above 6.2, you should consider using gypsum. And think of using these products as a fertilizer at this stage in the game, not as a soil amendment. So I would recommend using uh, powdered and pelletized gypsum or powdered and pelletized limestone and put them in the furrow or in a two by two at an application rate of 20 to 40 to 80 pounds per acre. Sometimes in, it, in uh, some situations you might go as high as 200 pounds per acre in extreme situations, but these by these materials being very finely ground, very fine particle size, they react very quickly and you create this localized flush of high calcium availability in the root zone exactly as you would if you applied a nitrogen fertilizer. And, um, and then of course, the other key aspect, again, I'm focusing on this from a chemistry perspective, but the other key aspect is also put microbial inoculants in that furrow, get that furrow and that, uh, root zone to be extremely active, microbially active, and that's going to give you your shot of calcium supply that you're really looking for. Yeah. Now, uh, John, I've, I've known you a while now, John, and I'll tell you what I really, there's so many things I admire about you, but one of the main things I admire about you is that you very rarely try to sell the products that, that you have a company for, and we're going to go there right now because we have to. We have, we're talking about we're trying to help people here, John, and, and help the farmers. So let's now talk about AEA for a moment and what it would be the, the product that you would have as a companion there, if you're allowed to talk about that. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. You know the funny part about this and the comment you made? I, I've had 
someone uh, call me recently or reach out to me. I forget where I heard this, but um, they said, we've listened to all of your podcast episodes multiple times, and we just found out that you have a company. Right. Which, <laughs> in, one, in one sense, is a bit of a compliment. In another sense, perhaps not so much. But um, to, to your question, the, the inferro combination that we have that has this effect of releasing uh, calcium and other nutrients and really stimulating the rhizophagy process is a combination of um, a biostimulant called Rejuvenate, and, uh, which is not a living inoculant, combined with a seed treatment called a Biocoat Gold. Um, and occasionally we also add an, another inoculant called Spectrum, kind of depends on the context. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And um, also depend on the context, we frequently add a material called Sea Shield, which um, has a crab shell, shrimp shell, liquid fish combination that really stimulates many of the right bacteria to produce a disease suppressive soil microbiome. So. The goal of that combination is to create such a rich environment of biology right in that root zone that we get this strong flush of nutrients that is not temporary. We want a flush of nutrient availability that lasts for 80 to 90 to 100 days, which is very, very different from the flush of nutrient supply that you get from soluble fertilizer that lasts for 20 or 30 days and then it's gone. Um, and the second thing that we want to accomplish with that application is we want to develop a microbiome in that root system that strongly suppresses disease. So we want disease uh, potential pathogens to have no opportunity to set up shop and to cause an infection. Right. So would so let okay so let's let's talk about two different farming practices now. Let's talk about first the the individual that wants to start to move toward more regenerative type practices and probably their biology is a little compromised at this point would you recommend then that they use these attributes from from an aea or or maybe any you know whoever but should that be part of the program to help speed this biology process up absolutely there is no replacement for it in my opinion and that's yeah. not my opinion because I happen to sell these products. I developed these products because that was my opinion. Yeah. Um, and so I think the there's this, I don't know if I would call it a debate, but there are different perspectives and different points of view on how products should be used in, in the transition or in the adoption of regenerative agriculture practices. One point of view is you just stop using any products at all. And uh, the other point of view, which is the one that I hold, is that uh, we do need to use the right products that are properly designed um, to speed up the transition, to get to the point where we don't need to put on any products anymore. And um, there are many farmers who have had varying levels of success by uh, simply discontinuing all product applications. But often, far too often in my opinion, there is a strong economic delay that uh, the economic returns take several years to catch up and many farmers don't have the luxury of having a strong enough cash flow to have that several years of economic or delay of economic returns they need returns immediately the first year and that was really what drove us to develop these products and these materials is so that we can rapidly transition we can take growers who are putting on a lot of mainstream products who want to transition we can replace some of those mainstream inputs with inputs that enhance biology and we can uh, maintain or increase yields immediately the first year and maintain that strong those strong economics but we begin shifting the soil we begin dramatically shifting the soil and then two or three or five years or seven years down the road whatever is relevant depending on their soil health context they can begin transitioning completely off those products and they have no yield slump and no yield drag ever yeah. but they've transitioned their soil from being drug dependent to being completely independent. Right. Now we've got a couple questions here, but I want to make another comment here while we're right here. I've been too stubborn over the years. I feel like on our farm, by doing all the practices we're doing, we are growing the biology we need. I feel that I truly do. But 
I'm with you, John. It's it's there's too long of a delay there. It's happening, but it's not happening quick enough. I've been too stubborn. And yes, I am going to try some of these products. Now, what I really like the notion of here, John, is is using using products that are with at that are inherent within your region of where you are located. I mean, this may be just crazy stuff I think about, but I try to think about that context. And this is so important that we don't we don't think about this enough a lot of the times. Or if we do think about context, we're thinking about, well, we can't plant this cover crop species here because it, it won't grow here. That I'm way, we're talking way beyond that now. We're talking about what is the microbial biome within your region of where you are living, and should we be working on promoting the growth of those local, let's just call them local residents? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, thinking of how I want to answer your, or, or respond to your question, I would propose so he, <clears throat> the easy answer is yes, that we should uh, culture and propagate and seek to expand what we have in our local ecosystems and our local landscape, what was native there originally before it started to be degraded, perhaps in fence rows or so forth. Although there's a question mark about any of those environments really offer what might have been there originally 100 years ago. But I, th my opinion is I think we really need to change this conversation and we need to change the way that we think about biology. Um, we should not think about biology only in terms of individual species and, and uh, sig uh, single species. Now that we know that there are individual species and strains of those species that are very important and that if we inoculate just one species, it can make a significant impact very quickly. The obvious example that everyone is familiar with is rhizobium. We wouldn't imagine planting legumes without inoculating with them with rhizobium. It's one species. We know it works. It's such an accepted practice. We don't even think about it. No, well, there sure. are many other species that are like that as well, that have a similar degree of robustness and we can inoculate them and they can have an immediate strong impact. But I would suggest that that is still thinking about it too narrowly. That what we really should be thinking about is we should be thinking about the capacity of biology to exchange and share genetic information. So if we culture a bacteria in the laboratory and we expose it to antibiotics, um, that bacterial culture will very rapidly develop antibiotic resistance, not just to the antibiotic that we added, but also to dozens of others, including some that we haven't even developed yet. This is something else that Stephen Buhner talks about in his book, Plant Intelligence, or one of his books, I think it's that one. Um, so this bacteria will develop resistance to lots of different antibiotics. Then you add that bacteria to the soil and it shares that genetic information on how to be resistant to that group of antibiotics, not just to other bacteria of the same species, but to all the living organisms in the entire soil profile. And in a matter of days or at most a few weeks, the entire soil microbial community contains this genetic information about how to be resistant to those antibiotics. Oh my God. Isn't that incredible? That, that's crazy, John. That's crazy. So now what we should be thinking about is, okay, we have this strain of bacteria that is known to be particularly effective at releasing and solubilizing phosphorus because it releases a lot of the phosphatase enzyme. So when we add that bacterial species to the soil, it's not so much the effect of that we're adding one species that is really good at absorbing phosphorus. It's that we are adding that genetic information to the entire soil microbial community. Well, see, this is way different than I was thinking on this. I, again, that 5 billion pieces of the puzzle, um, you've got me really thinking now I mean, what really brings it home for me was the rhizobia. I mean, you're exactly right. We're, we are all just treating 
uh, our legumes with uh, with rhizobia. Uh, yeah, it's one and, species. Yeah, and, only and one. Who, <laughs> and who knows where it came from? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's um, both as is so often true in agriculture in these complex ecosystems, it is not that one perspective is correct and another one is incorrect. It's that both are correct in different contexts and in different circumstances. So there's this argument that uh, you should never add purchased inoculants of a single strain or 20 different strains because how can you expect that a few strains are going to establish a viable population in a soil that has billions of bacteria per teaspoon of soil? And yet we do it every day with rhizobium. And this argument is made yeah. by the folks who are using compost teas and, and worm teas and so forth. And then um, the argument from folks producing the inoculants is that, um, well, the compost teas may not have the stuff in there because stuff has been lost in the ecosystem and the environments that they may not have the stuff in there that is really needed by that ecosystem. Both are correct. And we need to, in my opinion, we need to include both perspectives. Oh my gosh, John, you just, my, my brain is leaking here. The, the, uh, the information, no, let's, let let me get to a question here. Okay. Um, this is from Jeremy. Hello, uh, Jeremy from Michigan. I heard you talk of a quick do it yourself way of checking a crop for what it needs without sending in a sap analysis. You said to take a bricks reading, put on a, put on a full layer and check bricks again in a half an hour. How do I know that the increase in bricks is from increased photosynthesis and not just from the full layer that I just sprayed? It's really easy. You do a check, treated and untreated. You do a bricks before and after on both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great idea. And you should always do that no matter what you're using, any product, yep. leave, leave check strips. Yeah, yep, absolutely. great question, Jeremy. You Thank dig you. dig deeper into that, there's a blog post on that where I go into some detail on how to, uh, um, how to conduct those experiments. All right. Th thank you, Jeremy, for that question. Um, do your products, this is from Steve, do your products show response on non-organic crops for conventional farming methods? We already kind of touched on that, but go ahead and expand just a little bit more. It's pretty easy. The majority of our customers are not organically certified. I don't know exact numbers, but we're probably in the neighborhood of, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30% organically certified acres, maybe even less than that. Wow. So yeah, uh, and many of our non-organic farmers have no desire or intention of becoming organically certified, but it's just, they're making more money with our approach than they had been historically. Right. And so that's why they're using it. Right, and again, it, it all, and folks, it all goes back to your, your, your profitability, your ROI, whatever you want to call it. It's not about bushels here, it's about, maximizing what you're going to get out of every acre so just just remember that um all right we got we have another question here um this is from deanne uh, hey guys great conversation going back to the plant hormones for a second can the hormonal health of the plant affect the hormonal health of the humans who eat those plants or seeds from those plants if the hormones of the plants are out of whack uh Will I got something? There's more here, but I want to add to this question: uh, Will the will the hormones be back? Will they be out of whack? But let's also go a little bit further on this question, John. What about the 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 animals that are eating these plants? Sheep, goats, cattle, and so on. The short answer is yes. Um, anyone who's familiar with um, human health and endocrinology knows that one of the challenges of our immune system, uh, if we become ill, is with uh, one of the potential challenges is to have such a strong immune reaction that we trigger a cytokine cascade. Uh, a cytokine cascade is the same types of hormonal interactions that occur with plant cytokines. So there definitely is crossover. Um, however, uh, so the brief answer is that yes, when you have plants with um, really skewed hormonal profiles, they will without question affect the hormonal profiles of livestock and of people to the point where they will um, influence conception rates and fertility in livestock that can be very observable, very noticeable. And, uh, but the, the bigger question is actually, or the, um, the bigger factor actually is not the plant hormones themselves, 
and I'm speaking about agriculture broadly here, uh, the biggest factor is not the plant hormones themselves, but this multitude of compounds that we spray on our plants that are potent endocrine disruptors. So when I talk about endocrine disruptors, this is, Rick, I could talk about this for two hours in and of itself. Um, well, actually, I've forgotten much of what I knew at one point because it was so depressing and I haven't paid any attention for the last 10 years. But um, so our endocrine system, if you think about just for a moment, we have of the U.S. population right now, 45% of women and 50 some percent of men are expected to get, who are living today, are expected to get cancer in their lifetime. And of those, you look at the fractions or the, the proportion of those total cancers that are associated with the endocrine and the reproductive system. That for guys is testicular cancer, pancreatic cancer, for leaders it's, it's breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer. If you look at the, that portion, it's a significant percentage. In fact, I think if you combine all of them, it's a majority, mm -hmm. significant majority. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about the human endocrine system. We're talking about, I don't even know if I can recite them all off the top of my head, but the thymus gland, the reproductive system, the thyroid, all of these pieces are connected. So all our, our total endocrine system. And um, another word for our endocrine system would be to say our hormonal system, because that's the foundation. Those are the creators, the engines, the drivers of our hormonal system. Well, if you were to bring all the hormones together, the hormones, uh, these hormones are usually measured in parts per million. And for some of them, they're measured in parts per billion concentrations, active concentrations in our bodies. If you were to bring the hormones together from all the ladies on the entire planet, in one place, you would have a total of seven pounds, <laughs> seven pounds. For guys, it's 10 times greater. If you were to bring the hormones from all the guys on the planet together in one place, it would be 70 pounds. Now, many of our pesticides, the majority of herbicides, and as far as I know, all 100% of insecticides and fungicides are known endocrine disruptors. And they are applied in and on our food supply to the tune of tens of millions of pounds of active ingredients. And they have desired or uh, uh, permitted levels, according to the FDA, that accumulate to, to um, millions of pounds allowed in our food supply collectively. And so you look at that and you say, huh, endocrine disrupting chemicals allowed in and on our food supply in significant quantities and all of these reproductive system cancers, is there a connection? Well, they certainly parallel in terms of application. So that's, 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 that's crazy. I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have through poor, poor choices, John, and poor habits, I'm now a type two diabetic. So is it maybe all due to my poor choices or is it due to the, the, the disruptors you've just talked about? I think it's some of both probably. It's a combination. It's certainly a combination. And I'm not suggesting that it's ag chemicals alone, which are causing all these uh, right. reproductive cancers. There's other pollution factors in our water and our air and, and uh, the ways that we think and the things that we believe. So there's other contributing factors as well, I'm not suggesting it's ag chemicals alone, but I do believe that ag chemicals are a significant contributing factor. Right. Um, also, there's a question from Deanne, are synthetic fertilizers also endocrine disruptors? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have one other question here from Gregory Jacks. Um, uh, John, I do not have a furrow application on my planter. I use self-propelled sprayers. What about products that you would recommend that would be for a surface applied or a foliar feed? Same, same types of products, same types of recommendations, just perhaps timed differently or positioned differently. So. It's a very common practice for us to put on broadcast applications rather than inferro or to use yeah. seed treatments instead of inferro. It's uh, you have to figure out what works with given the context of equipment and, and the farm's capabilities. 
Right, but I think what's very important here that we haven't probably thought enough about is what you talked about earlier. What is the demand for that crop you're raising and when should you have that product there? I, I, you know, we just try to make it easy. We go out in the fall and we apply it in the fall because that's when we got the most time. That's when we got the most time. It's when the co-ops want to apply it. And the reality is that's when it costs us the most. Why does it cost us the most? Because we need to put on five times more to get the yeah. same crop response if we properly applied it. Um, this is true of nitrogen. You know, for a corn crop, 80% um, of a corn crop's nitrogen requirement occurs after pollination. 80%? 80%. One of the things that uh, we do a lot that you that you know you're going to try it this, this year, Rick, is sap analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't even keep track. There must be hundreds, actually probably thousands of growers at this point who we have persuaded to leave a part of their cornfield or leave one cornfield on, on often when we first start working with the grower the first time we'll suggest that we significantly cut nitrogen application rates at planting and we plan to do the majority side dress based on soil and sap analysis data and then we often ask them to take one field or one section and this is once we have some soil data and we're comfortable making this recommendation we often ask them to leave one strip with no applied nitrogen at planting, and we're going to do all of it side dress later, only based on crop requirements, based on sap analysis. We have taken hundreds of those strips, the first year right out of the gate, all the way up to tasseling, or even a couple weeks after tasseling, with the sap analysis showing surplus nitrogen, surplus nitrogen week after week after week, all the way up to post tassel. It has happened hundreds of times, and farmers are just blown away and amazed like how is it possible that i can be growing my crop and it's nice and dark green all the way down the ground with no nitrogen application yet it happens constantly it's really pretty simple the reason for that is a corn's nitrogen requirement up to the tasseling stage is somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds per acre almost all soils are capable of delivering that from previous sure. residue if not from anything else sure yeah mineralization, whatever the case may yeah. be. Yeah. Well, we've got a question here from our good friend, Lauren Steinlogge. Um, How does oxygen levels in the soil affect this biological process? Um, my understanding is that, um, uh, Lauren, you ask interesting questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Soils really need to have good gas exchange. That's the proper way of answering the question. And it's the proper way of us thinking about it is we need to have soils that have good gas exchange. When gas exchange gets shut off for a period of about 72 hours, really negative things start happening. Um, so this can, this can occur from uh, saturation. Uh, for example, if you have soils that are saturated and you have standing water, uh, the crop is actually fine. If you look at a crop, um, the, the crop usually is fine and continues to do well for about a 72 hour period, sometimes even a bit longer than that. And it's because uh, the biology and the root system of the plant can access the dissolved oxygen content in that water. And that dissolved oxygen content usually lasts for about 72 to 96 hours. And then it's depleted. And that is when you start having really negative effects to both soil biology and to root systems from oxygen depletion. Um, so uh, the answer is yes, we need to have good gas exchange. And if we have saturated soils, we've got a window of time to fix that, but it's a fairly short window of time. So, so John, what would you list would be the three or four top limiting factors to raising a corn crop? Um, water, carbon dioxide, calcium supply, and nitrogen and potassium at specific stages. And the interesting part, I talked about calcium and I talked about nitrogen, but calcium, nitrogen, potassium, all three of them, the peak demand is after tasseling. If you think about, I use, I gave the numbers for nitrogen, the quantity of about 15 to 20 pounds per acre up through the tasseling stage, it's 
it's a really small amount. Mm -hmm. But after that, you're going to need 60, 80 units or better. Um, and usually in a short time window, three to four weeks, six weeks, uh, the same is true of calcium, the same is true of potassium. Um, so I would say those, just in terms of quantity and, and most common limiting factors, those are the most common limiting factors. Now, the one that you mentioned there that, that, that is intriguing or, or blows both people's minds is you said carbon dioxide. Yeah. You seen the you know the barrel with the broken off staves? I've never seen one of those that included water and carbon dioxide on it, which is really stupid as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so so let's talk about carbon dioxide. So, you know, I'm thinking here I you know, you've got a corn crop growing. You hopefully have a a, a green cover crop that you you planted that corn into. Now, let's figure out how we can terminate that cover at the right time to now feed that carbon dioxide to the corn plant. You nailed it, Rick. You nailed it. The question that we should be asking is, what's the right time for us to terminate this cover crop so that we get carbon dioxide released from that cover crop? Because carbon dioxide, um, we know that when we grow plants in an indoor controlled environment, whether that be, whether that might be peppers or tomatoes or cannabis or whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, if we increase carbon dioxide levels with, when all other variables are the same, genetics, lighting, temperature, nutrition, all other variables are the same. When we increase carbon dioxide levels from 450 to 1100 parts per million, we get double the plant biomass and double the yield. And the same is true of corn. In fact, yeah, I think it might even be more than double with corn because it's a C4 photosynthetic pathway plant, but that's a different conversation. Um, Corn plants are so efficient, being a C4 plant, they are so efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide that in most agricultural environments, uh, corn is usually grown surrounded by thousands of acres of other cornfields. And so if you look at this broader landscape view, they will usually deplete carbon dioxide levels in the local atmosphere right in the plants in, the, in a cornfield down to less than 100 parts per million by 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning. And that means for the rest of the day, it doesn't matter that you have perfect sunlight and water and growing conditions. Carbon dioxide is the limiting factor for photosynthesis. Yeah. And um, so the key is to increase the local carbon dioxide supply within the crop canopy by releasing it from the soil, not by putting on anhydrous ammonia, which we've been doing for the last 40 years, <laughs> but instead by uh, releasing it from the oxidation or the decomposition of crop residue or cover crop residue, as you described, or from microbial respiration from the soil. That's the two places that our carbon dioxide supply should be coming from. So let's go back now to those principles of soil health. This is why we need to build that aggregate stability. I mean, on our farm now, John, we, we can measure aggregate stability six, seven inches down now. We have yep. all of that room now for this to breathe. And, exactly. and it's exactly what you were referring to with Lauren's question. This soil is a living, breathing organism that needs to exhale. It needs to inhale and exhale. It needs to inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide exactly the same way that we do. And you know, now that you have six or seven inches of good aggregate stability, you have that depth capacity uh, of inhaling and exhaling, releasing carbon dioxide. So let's say that you have the equivalent of uh, exhaling a seven inch thick blanket of carbon dioxide on top of your soil. Mm -hmm. And so the, when earth, when soil exhales, the, the gases, the air that it releases are about 20 to 30,000 parts per million CO2. It's about two to 3%. It's very different from the background atmospheric CO2 of 400 plus parts per million. So, and then of course that diffuses out into the atmosphere, unless you have green plants there intercepting it. Um, so the question is, how deep is that layer of 20,000 parts per million CO2 that is being released? Is it a two inch thick layer? Is it a quarter inch thick layer? Or is it, as in your case, a six to seven inch thick layer? Um, so that, that is really a measurement of a soil's, a soil's capacity to breathe and to respire is a measurement of a soil's capacity to deliver carbon dioxide to the growing crop. Yeah, and see that that's that's huge. Most people 
would not have carbon dioxide in the top four of a limiting factor to a corn crop. No way. Oh, without question, it is. In fact, it's, uh, I would say in most crops today, it's equal to, if not bigger, limiting factor than water. See, that's crazy. That's just crazy. That's yeah. crazy. But I totally agree with you. All right, we've got to... Well, the guys, I mean, look, there was any number. There's uh, over a dozen demonstration farms in the late 70s across the Midwest who are producing 400 plus bushel per acre on a field scale year after year. And uh, they were doing that with carbon dioxide supply. This was in the late 70s. We've gone backwards since then. Yeah. Well, we've gone backwards in a lot of ways. We used to have, we've got 30% less nutrient density than we had 25 years ago. So um, our soils are tired and wore out. So that, that, that attributes to that. Um, got a question here from our, our friend Mitchell Hora. John, carbon is the big binders on buzzword or carbon is the big blinders on buzzword. Two questions. CO2 is a common limiting factor. Will storing it underground after being pumped from pipelines cause production issues and deficiencies long term? Maybe like sulfur is today. That's go ahead. That's number. That's question number one. That's a good question. Um, you know, if the politicians would just get out of the way, ethanol would die a quick, painless death. And boy, would I be happy to see that day. And I probably just ticked a whole bunch of people off, but I guess that's okay. Um, the yeah, I think. Um, anyway, it's crazy. But um, I guess the question wasn't actually about ethanol, was it? Um, that one was not. He was talking about storing it underground after right. being pumped from pipelines. So, look, farmers who are growing green plants love to have high CO2. If we, if we actually deplete carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere down to 320 parts per million, is that going to have a negative impact? on plant health and yield compared to where it is today. Um, it might slightly, but uh, on, a, on a macro scale, but I'm really not too concerned about it because um, the, I'm gonna make up my own language here a little bit. Um, the way that I understand it, the, the local carbon cycle, and I'm talking about local as in 10 square feet, the local carbon cycle can easily supersede the macro carbon cycle. Um, where, as in the case on your farm, Rick, um, if you are growing cover crops, if you have green photosynthesizing plants, see, see let, me, let me try to explain this in a little bit of a different way. The healthiest soils, the highest yielding soils, are not soils which store the most carbon. We need to get rid of that fallacy. We're not trying to store carbon. They are the soils and plants, because they're both part of the ecosystems, they're the soil and plant ecosystems, which cycle the largest volume of carbon. Mm -hmm. So we have carbon temporarily stored in our soils and then being cycled and released as carbon dioxide by microbial respiration and then recaptured by green plants and moved back into the soil. So there is this cycle. We want that cycle to lose zero but to actually also be positive and gain more from the atmosphere. So you could have that local cycle on 10 square feet, and I'm just making up hypothetical numbers here, but let's say on 10 square feet, you are cycling 100 pounds of carbon every year, and you're not losing any of it in the bulk atmosphere, but you're constantly siphoning in and gaining, let's say 5% or 10% of that. So the reality, is if you have that local ecosystem performing really well and cycling carbon really well, then what happens in the bulk atmosphere is only of minimal consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're too hung up on this. Um, we're also too hung up on just looking at carbon as one phase, you know, a solid phase. Um, there, there, and, and the storing in the ground notion, it's just the carbon, the whole carbon conversation is just, it's, I, I don't know. I just don't agree it's with a it. Sad, it's a sad detractor from uh, the ecosystems conversation that we really need to be having. And yeah. uh, I'm actually concerned that the whole conversation around regenerative agriculture is, um, it could easily lose credibility 
a decade or two down the road or less by being so closely associated with the carbon conversation. Yeah. Regenerative agriculture needs to be much bigger than just carbon. All right. Totally agree. Totally agree. Well, the second part of Mitchell's question was there, um, what would you do with a billion, B, a billion is in B is in boy, billion dollars coming from the government to this space if it all went to John Kempf? What would you do with it, John? <laughs> um, I actually answered that question in an hour and a half long podcast episode with Cohen Van Sijen from the Investing in Region of Agriculture podcast. Uh, he asked me the question, how would I invest a billion dollars in facilitating regenerative agriculture? So there's, if you really want the depth answer to that question, you go listen to that podcast episode. <laughs> but I think the, the, the fundamentals of the question are that um, I would invest those resources to uh, create a better system, a better business system for agriculture that is so much more effective and efficient and so much more profitable for growers that it would completely displace the status quo. It's as in Buckminster Fuller said, don't try to fight something, just create something that's so much better that it automatically displaces what currently exists. Right. Well, let's let's roll into a different area here, John. Another area that's intriguing to me and it's it 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 really shows how stubborn I am because I am a firm believer against tillage. But let's talk about if you were to you can allow never grow potatoes. Well, I never could grow potatoes, that's right, or, or carrots <laughs> probably. Um, but if you were to allow the tillage, and let's assume that, that we're going to do what, what's called green manuring. So we've raised a pretty broad, diverse uh, package of cover crops, and we're going to now till this under in the spring, prepping the, those acres to plant, let's say, a corn crop into. Talk us through that. What what is this okay to do? What what augmentations should we add to this process? What products of yours? Just give us the whole the whole the whole thing. Who are you and what did you do to Rick Clark? <laughs> this is not my question. I'm just ask, asking a question from the audience. <laughs> I told you I'm stubborn, John. You know that. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe you asking that question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rick, can you ask me the last? What, what is the question exactly? Like, the what question. practices would you? If my understanding of the question is, what practices would you or products would you incorporate to mitigate the negative effects of tillage? Is that what we're asking? Well, that's part of the question. But what do you do? You think that if if we are turning down a, a crop that is quickly going to be consumed, are we starting the healing process quick enough that, that then allows that tillage practice to happen? I would say that um, my perspective is that there are very few absolutes in agriculture. Um, and I'm actually of the opinion that there are specific circumstances and instances with soil structure and soil type and so forth where uh, tillage is a very useful tool to begin transitioning and to begin turning the system around. But I'm of the persuasion that generally uh, we should not we should not design a management system where we are relying on the continued use of tillage year after year after year as a management tool. Mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't plan to continue using it for the next 20 years, the next 50 years, unless we are growing a crop that necessarily demands it like potatoes or something like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of my uh, philosophical well, not, not, so, not so much philosophical, but uh, kind of my practical point of view on, on how I think we should look at regeneration from a long-term perspective. And if our answer is, well, I can't grow crop X on my soil without tillage, my question for you would be, who said you need to grow crop X? <laughs> That's true. Like, here's the crazy truth. 
And it's crazy only because so few people exercise their freedom in availing themselves a better opportunity. For the last 12 out of the last 15 years, it has it would have been more profitable in dollars and cents in the farmer's pocket at the end of the day to plant grasses and graze stockers, selling, buying beef at wholesale in the spring, selling them at wholesale in the fall. 12 out of the last 15 years, they would have made significantly more money doing that than growing corn. Significantly more. I'm talking two to three X more per acre. And yet people don't do it. Yeah. It's because it's it's not something they're they're familiar with doing. Dad didn't do it. Grandpa didn't do it. Well, Grandpa probably did it, but Dad didn't do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's go back real quick to this this green manure notion. Um, is that it? Will this help the carbon cycling process? Yes. So green manure. I mean, we if we're thinking about cover crops and um, incorporating cover crops, we should think of our cover crops. Um, kind of as, uh, they're, they're two distinct categories, just like dry products that we apply to the soil are con uh, frequently categorized as either soil amendments or fertilizers. Cover crops are the same. We should think of cover crops as being either soil builders or fertilizers. If you have a legume cover crop like alfalfa that's 20 inches tall and you incorporate that, till it in, plow it in, whatever, that's not going to build soil. It's not going to happen. You will not get a long-term gain on organic matter from that practice. You will get a very strong fertilizer effect. You'll get a very strong fertilizer effect from the following crop, perhaps from the following two or three crops. So you get a very positive effect, but you don't get long-term gains on organic matters because you have a very narrow carbon nitrogen ratio uh, crop residue when it's incorporated and you trigger primarily bacterial digestion. So the question we should be thinking about is that the difference between soil builders and crop fertilizers uh, and cover crops is do you trigger fungal digestion versus bacterial digestion? So if you have a mature crop residue with lots of lignin and complex carbons, you're going to trigger primarily fungal digestion and that will have the effect of building soil organic matter, but it may have a detrimental effect on the crop from a nutrition perspective because that decomposition process can actually pull nutrients from the crop. Um, whereas with crop residue with a narrow nitrogen to carbon ratio, you're going to trigger bacterial digestion, the mineralization process, and it is the equivalent of a fertilizer response, but yeah. it doesn't build soil. Yeah, now that, that's amazing how, and, and it, and can you see that also affect if you're out of, if you're a heavy <laughs> bacterial based uh, soil versus a more balanced, you'll see a difference in that as well? Yes, you'll definitely see a difference in crop response, but you can also, you can shift that to some degree with the, with the degree of maturity that you're incorporating a cover crop. Yeah. I see. I see. Very good. This is, oh, this is such good stuff here. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? Uh, what are, what are, a f this is from Steve Hoffman. How are we doing, Steve? What are a few things you would do to a soybean crop to get more nodes? What products and timing of those products? There's a really easy answer to that question. You just go to the Advancing Eco Agriculture website and look at our soybean program and pull it up. And exactly what we recommend is designed to do exactly that. Yeah. Um, in in broad brush strokes, general terms, we need to get more of our growth energy from calcium, less from nitrogen. Uh, do not apply potassium early, and um, particularly make sure that the plant has generous levels of the trace minerals, particularly manganese, boron. Um, zinc and cobalt those four are going to have a strong influence on the hormonal system of a soybean plant Re, uh, those what are those four again john please those four were boron cobalt zinc and manganese zinc manganese very good this is this is just this is awesome i i really hope that people are, are out there paying attention to this because this is what the information you're giving us tonight, John, is how you build a system that will work into the future. The information that I've given you tonight, if farmers actually apply it and apply it correctly, has the potential to make any farmer who applies it well tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
I guess yeah. we do this. We do this all the time, every day on farms. Um, actually, while we're speaking about the trace minerals, zinc and manganese and boron, um, I, I do want to bring up one other piece. Uh, there is a favorite trace mineral that mainstream contemporary agronomy uses today quite widely. It's zinc. Zinc is now applied routinely in furrow at planting on corn, it's sprayed on it. So now it become a routine application because they have measured it. They've done the research, the homework that they know there's a yield response from zinc, but they don't usually recommend or not nearly as commonly anyway, uh, recommend uh, manganese applications and copper applications and iron applications and so forth. And we should be asking the question, why? Why not? Going back to our calcium and boron story, why are they not recommending manganese and iron and copper like they are zinc? And there's a very simple reason. Uh, zinc only exists in soils and in biological systems in one oxidation state. It's always zinc plus plus. It's a double positive. And so that means no matter how challenged the soil from a microbial perspective, no matter how dead the biology, no matter how dysfunctional it is, any zinc that gets applied to the soil is going to be available for the crop to absorb. That's not true of manganese and copper and iron. It's particular manganese and iron, this is a particularly big deal for. Um, and the reason that manganese and iron are not more widely used is because uh, they are commonly applied on soils that will convert them from the reduced state, uh, triple positive to the oxidized, excuse me, uh, double positive to the oxidized state of being a triple positive, which is not biologically active in plants. So uh, you can produce the same or bigger yield response with manganese and iron as you can with zinc, but it has to be in the right oxidation state and it has to be properly applied. And uh, manganese is one of those little things. You know, it's, we have this, uh, this foliar product called Accelerate. That's a combination of seaweed and manganese and boron and a few other things that I'm forgetting right now. And um, it's really easy, like it's absurdly easy to increase the pod count on soybeans by 50% or even as much as 80%. We just put on a foliar application of Accelerate at the third trifoliate and we can load up a soybean plant with a tremendous number of pods. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get increased yield because you now have to fill all those beans. And beans are really good at either aborting any that they can't fill or they're just producing a larger number of beans that are smaller. So in order to get an actual yield response, you then have to deliver a lot of potassium during the seed fill period um, and make sure that they have enough, which again comes back to manganese supply. Awesome. This is just awesome, John. You just you you you've absolutely blown my mind here this evening. I, this is just exactly what I wanted from you tonight. Um, what what else have we what have we not touched on? I mean, I know we could go on for hours here, but uh, what have we not touched on? Yeah, that <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> we're never yeah. you ask that question we will never get to the end of the list <laughs> well for everyone out there we're john is sitting in his library and i've been there and he has read every one of those books so uh that's why this young man is is so good and such a wealth of knowledge uh, because he is so willing to learn from others um I just can't thank you enough, John. It's it's um, what you're what you're doing for this space is 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 unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Well, thank you, Rick. We we all have our gifts and talents that we're given, and uh, it is when we're given them and entrusted with them that it's our responsibility to exercise them. We all have our own talents to bring to the conversation, and uh, um, I. I'm grateful that I'm able to bring mine and I'm grateful for everyone else bringing theirs. Yeah. Now, one other thing I'd like to talk about is, is teaching. You're, you're a very good teacher, but let's, let's think about this on a big scale. Okay. So if we really want to move, um, if we really want to move a large ache, amount of acres toward, you know, whatever regenerative farming truly is, we're going to have to have teachers, and then we're going to have to have teachers teaching teachers. I mean, how do you see this happening? 
if, if this should really get a big head of steam going, all of a sudden we're planting 60 million acres to cover crops. How, do, how are we going to do this? Yeah. That's a multifaceted question. There is, uh, there is the need for teachers. And parallel to that, or perhaps even before that, be before you need the teachers, you also need... Um, you need the desire to change. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, it's the responsibility of the teachers to create that desire for change. But there's obviously other drivers and other, uh, other mechanisms in play there as well. You know, you can think of this almost, and, and this, I don't want to, um, I don't want to turn people off by using this analogy, but I think it's appropriate in some ways. It's almost like uh, evangelism. Um, you can't, there's this one preacher, I forget where I read this, but um, a very famous evangelist said that uh, I can't bring anyone to salvation without first convincing them that they're lost. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so true, isn't it? Yeah. And so I think if we want to transition 60 million acres, um, we'd first need lots of folks to realize that they're on the wrong path. Yeah. And uh, there are different ways of bringing that about. Uh, one of the ways, which I personally believe is to be the, the, the strongest driver, is um, very clearly demonstrating that there is a lot of economic, untapped economic potential, that they could be making a lot more money by farming differently than they are right now. And that's really right. been our pathway at AEA, is to just show the profitability opportunities of growers making a transition and being immensely more profitable. Um, so I see that as one of the primary pathways. But then to, to really answer your question about um, the teachers, you know, there's this saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And um, I believe that we collectively, humans, society as a whole, we collectively in the agriculture community, we already know enough. We don't need any new information. Uh, there's new additional things we'd like to know and things that we'd like to understand better. But if we just implemented what we collectively already know, then we could transition the entire planet very effectively, not just 60 million acres. And um, yes, we do need teachers, we need more evangelists, but the good news is that we're able now, it's, it's a very different world from what it was two years ago pre-COVID. Uh, and even before that, even five years ago, um, having conversations like this in an online environment was something that was becoming popular in some parts of society, but not in agriculture. It didn't happen. Farmers were still the salt of the earth. There was this culture that you meet in person, you have these face-to-face -face relationships. Uh, and I'm not discounting the value of that. That's all really important. But the last two years of people moving to an online environment has really created an opportunity for us where we can have this conversation and it can be participated in and listened to by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people and so I think, um, obviously, we need the infield coaching. We need the infield support. Um, farmers, growers wanting to go through this transition need to have someone beside them who has walked the path already. And right. this is fundamentally our, our work at AEA, but it's something that we need many more people to be doing well. So right. it definitely is something that we need to scale. And I think... Um, you know, it's, it's interesting you should ask me that question because this last year at AEA, we went through a really interesting transformation uh, in the business and that, or I should say that I personally did. Um, every year, we set a whole series of aspirational goals that are, that they're, they're stretch goals enough that when you see them staring at you in the piece of paper, they make you rather uncomfortable. And we would hit many of them but not always all of them we've missed some but this last year was a bit different we we just exceeded every goal just month by month it was just tick 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 all the way through the year and by june or july i had this really interesting kind of personal revelation of realizing that you know what um i had created this identity for myself that i'm the guy that pushes aea and all of a sudden I realized that 
that wasn't going to be useful anymore into the future, if it was ever useful in the first place, which is uh, debatable. Um, but then we have such an amazing team and that, that company, that organization is doing such amazing work that it's, it's that train has left the station. It's yeah. moving, it's going, it doesn't need pushing anymore. Right. And so for myself personally, there was kind of this interesting realization and kind of this question of, huh, this is really interesting what comes next. And that's still emerging and still evolving for me. But one of the things that I realized that um, comes next for me is not being a leader or being the leader, but being a developer of other leaders. Yeah. And, you know, it was so interesting. Um, I, I made that, recognized that shift and started thinking about, okay, how can I be a developer of other leaders? And within months, I was asked to be the executive editor. Well, not within months, within weeks, I was asked to be the executive editor of Acres USA and other opportunities kept coming up for me to help bring other people to the front, which is just like, wow, what's, what's happening and what's going on. Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's paying attention, John. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, that's awesome. Um, we've got, we've got another question here. If it's okay, John, uh, we're, we're about headed for the home stretch here. Um, this is from Douglas in conventional ag. We've been sold that a certain nitrogen to sulfur ratio needs to be maintained in our inputs. Where does sulfur fall when nitrogen is being, maybe not, he's saying replaced with calcium, but uh, augmented with calcium, I would say. Yeah. Um, so the nitrogen to sulfur ratio still holds true. Um, and there's actually some math around this. Um, Gary Zimmer talks about this quite a bit. Um, Gary from Midwestern Bioag. He says that when you start reducing your nitrogen application, you can, um, you can cut, you can replace the first 20 pounds of nitrogen with 20 pounds of sulfur. Um, in terms of crop requirements, which I find to be an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, but we also, in biological systems, we want to see a 10 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur ratio if we're adding any nitrogen to the system. And um, the way that we should be thinking about it from a long-term perspective, um, so we understand uh, conventional agriculture or contemporary agriculture, as I prefer to call it, is um, recommending the constant application of sulfur because sulfur leaches just like nitrate nitrogen does except sometimes it doesn't and that's the question we should be asking is when does sulfur not leach when does boron not leach when does nitrate not leach when does molybdenum not leach those are all anions anions are not held by negatively charged clay colloids. We understand that, but they are held by carbon and organic matter. So it's actually possible for us to, as we develop soils that cycle large volumes of carbon and are temporarily holding large quantities of carbon in the uh, upper soil profile, that carbon, that organic matter has an anion exchange capacity, just like clay has a cation exchange capacity. So you can have um, higher organic content soils that have a high anion exchange capacity and can hold sulfur and prevent it from leaching and boron and molybdenum and nitrate nitrogen. So uh, from a short-term perspective, I'm in complete agreement. We do need to manage sulfur. We need to, to add it in a 10 to one ratio with nitrogen uh, is our common recommendation. From a mid to long-term perspective, we should be developing soil profiles that don't need the constant addition of sulfur because uh, you see there isn't just a carbon cycle there's also a nitrogen cycle there's also a sulfur cycle and there's also a phosphorus cycle all three of those nutrients in addition to carbon cycle through the atmosphere so and through soils so when those cycles are functional on our farms and in our soils then we shouldn't need to constantly be adding those nutrients yeah, that's fascinating. Again, it's it's understanding what what Mother Nature, the system she's built for us, understanding how to take advantage of that and try not to screw it up any worse than we already have. It's kind of what it boils down to. Yeah. So, John, I I you know what we could go on, but 
we've been over an hour and a half here. Let, let's let's take this home. What what would be some closing comments that you'd have for tonight tonight's uh, episode? Um, I think the one piece I would encourage all of us to the one talent we should all cultivate is we should be more curious. Be curious and observe. Carrie Reams used to say, many people don't see what they look at. And um, ask questions. Why is this plant expressing itself differently from that plant? It's many of us don't pay close enough attention and we don't observe. And this has been true for a long time, but I think it's been really exacerbated in the last decade with the widespread adoption of technology and smartphones and constant distraction. Yeah. Um, I find it fascinating that we can have a lamb's quarter plant, a weed that in one field can grow to be four feet tall and uh, maybe 12 inches in diameter at the widest point, and the next field 20 feet away, that exact same seed grows in a little round ball that's 24 inches in diameter. That's I've been able to uh, just observe differences in leaf or in plant expression and leaf shape expression. It's when we start paying attention to those small things that and asking questions is when we really start learning. And so um, that's what I would encourage all of us is um, become better at observing and be curious, ask questions. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. Great words, John. Thank Thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you on this evening, John. Thank you so much. Uh, taking away from your family time. We greatly appreciate this. Um, and again, those three books that John mentioned earlier, if I get these wrong, correct me, John, The Lost Language of Plants, Plant Intelligence, and The Secret Teachings of Plants. Uh, John's looking for the book in his library. There we go. I think you have them correct. And I don't even have my self view on here, so I'm not sure how clearly these come through. That's perfect. But, uh, to Steven. give you an idea, this is The Lost Language of Plants. This is the first book in the trilogy. And when I read, I go through and um, everything that I think I may want to revisit in the future gets a tab so that I can just flip through it. And this is really interesting. I really like this, this method. Uh, these are just typical post-it tabs. I really like this method because I can get, when I finish reading a book, usually when I read a book, um, I do it from cover to cover. And when I finish a book, I can look at the number of tabs and see how valuable I thought that book was. Some books get two or five tabs and then some books like this get a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, and, and spell the, gentleman, the author's last name, please, John. Uh, the last name, the very last name is Buhner, B-U-H-N-E-R. Okay. Very good. Well, John, thank you so much for being on. Thank you all. Uh, Happy you growing. Have, yep. Thank you, John. And you have a great weekend. And uh, I should have mentioned this at the, at the beginning of the podcast, but today is Monday, Thursday. Uh, so please keep all this in mind. We are heading into one of the holiest weeks there is of the year. Uh, Monday, Thursday is when um, the Last Supper took place and the washing of the feet took place. So Everyone, please, uh, please be safe and be prosperous this year. And again, John, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you.